is about stakeholder capitalism with, you know, mixing in the employees and how all that fits together and, and the, the changes here when we go from shareholder supremacy models to, to stakeholder balance models or, or sometimes we call multi-stakeholder capitalism. By the way, there's a very interesting difference in those two terms. Multi-stakeholder capitalism doesn't necessarily imply balanced stakeholder capitalism, but we may get into that today. We've been developing this conversation for a while now. Uh, this is the term that's that, that's been coming up uh, quite a bit within the context of, of ESG, Environment and Social and, and Governance. Um, you know, within this newest thinking are uh, affectionately what's becoming also known as the six capitals. And again, for those that you of you that that aren't, aren't f completely familiar, human, natural, intellectual, social, manufactured, and financial. I appreciated uh, uh, the comments that we had earlier, uh, uh, you know, from Matt around uh, proxy votes with the shareholders and, and how maybe stakeholders can participate in that. Uh, our group today, uh, very distinguished panelists, uh, are going to engage in C-suite engages in creating collaborative uh, relationships here, multi-capital models with respect to uh, the employees. Uh, what to do uh, and how to do it. We're, I think, past the why of it. I think that's self-evident. So I'd like to welcome Paul, Maury, and Brian, and thank you for you know, being with us today. I'd like you to each just please introduce yourselves. Uh, tell us um, you know, who you are and who you work with and for. Uh, and then just to kick us off a couple of things. How should companies think about creating a more balanced stakeholder approach? What, what, what are the mechanisms around that, that thinking? And then how business leaders uh, can ensure positive employee engagement within that model. Uh, so that might kick us off and then we'll go into some discussions for here for the better part of the hour. Paul, would you mind kicking us off? Well, sure. <clears throat> uh, welcome everybody. Delighted to be here at the 10th annual uh, New Metrics Conference now called Integrate. And it's called Integrate because we need to integrate stakeholders and shareholders together uh, and that includes CFOs, uh, CMOs, and of course CEOs. Um, so I'm Paul Herman from HIP Investor. <clears throat> Delighted to be here. HIP stands for Human Impact and Profit and that's what we can note in that the drivers of value start with people. And so most of us have heard that uh, CEOs say people are our most important asset, but people are a cost on the income statement. And so most CEOs focus on reducing cost of labor instead of focusing on the asset value of people and the innovation that they bring. And that innovation includes everything from inventing new products. So uh, Jeff was just talking on the main stage, Jeff Rochester about diversity and North Carolina State University has academically shown that companies with more diversity uh, that are more representative of the U.S. population, for example, innovate at twice the rate as others. So they have twice as many patents, which means if you have a patented product, you have a higher potential for higher revenue, um, as well as a higher competitive advantage. So, and it's not just about people, it's also about planet, and uh, we need to make sure that our natural resource efficiency is uh, sustainable and regenerative. Um, but the stake who holds the stakeholder for the environment are usually nonprofits, NGOs like Carbon Disclosure Project or the Science Based Targets Initiative. And so being able to set um, science based targets like 100% greenhouse gas reduction by 2030, like Stanley Black and Decker has done. Mm -hmm. So you might have tools from Black and Decker in your garage. Um, and then it also takes trust, it takes people, planet, and trust. And that uh, means keeping our institutions honest and accurate, but also disclosing. And so one of the things we may talk about today is in order to be have great stakeholder relations is to have transparency. And if you look at the material metrics, whether those be by SASB, uh, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, more than 30 to 40% of the material metrics, whether it means greenhouse gas emissions or employee engagement um, are missing. Companies are not reporting that. So we still have this transparency gap. Once we close that transparency gap, we can uh, close the performance gap between leaders and laggards. And then we can close the accountability gap. 
So last thing I'll say about that uh, in my intro is this accountability gap, we need to hold our leaders accountable, but it can also work into financial instruments. There can be closing of the accountability gap, let's say in a muni bond in Washington, DC, focused on water and wastewater that really will drain the swamp uh, and avoid pollution in the Potomac River and Chesapeake Bay. Uh, but there's only a handful of muni bonds that do that. And there's only a handful of stock-based securities that do that. Um, so I hope we'll get a chance to also talk about how to do this in your 401k. So yeah. I'll just pause yeah. right there on how to integrate stakeholders and shareholders together. Thank you, Paul. Mari, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, Scott. Um, Mari Wolf, I'm with Cox Enterprises out of Atlanta. So we are the parent company for Cox Automotive and Cox Communication. So um, for those unfamiliar, because I think it's just a little little helpful, um, the automotive division, think Kelly Blue Book, Auto Trader, all the components of a car deal outside of the, the manufacturing and the dealer, um, and Mannheim Auctions, that kind of thing. So a really large footprint in automotive space. And then on Cox Communication, it is internet and home services in that space um, in many markets across the U.S., um, and now we are standing up a third pillar around clean technology. Um, so I lead our corporate social responsibility and public affairs piece for this company. Um, and we're a little bit interesting. I, I agree with everything Paul said. We have a little bit of a different shift because we're a private company. Um, we're family owned, we're on our fourth generation family leader. Um, and so we don't have the same pressures of uh, share price and stockholders, but we do um, have many of the same drivers. So uh, we don't do it because our shareholders are pushing us, but we are down very far down our ESG journey and thinking about how do you continue to integrate um, the employee piece, which is one of our leading, and we see as one of our, our leading drivers to success. So we can talk a little bit about that. So I'd, I'd echo Paul's comments. The thing I would add um, to answer your question, Scott, is one of the things I think we're really learning about this um, engagement of um, stakeholders piece is that the employees not only need to be heard, but they need to be participants. And so what are the mechanisms to really stand that up so that um, it, it's not just part of an ad campaign, but fundamentally they are participating in making decisions about your future. Um, and so we can talk about some ways that we've been doing that, but I think it's We've had, certainly had more freedom to do that being a private company, but we've also had a lot of um, interesting stories and lessons learned about what that has done for us to, to, to drive the agenda. Yeah, and I know we'll get into this a little bit, the being family owned, sort of the, the flexibilities that that gives you and maybe some perspectives that we wouldn't have as sh sort of shareholder led, uh, you know, C-Corps. Uh, Brian, hey, hi. Hey, Scott. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Brian McCann. I'm the Director of Policy and Programs at USCIF, the Forum for Sustainable, Responsible, and Impact Investment. We're the leading voice for sustainable investment in the United States. We represent the, across all asset classes, and we, our primary work is done through uh, um, research and education programs, uh, convenings, as well as public policy, and that's where I sit. Um, so that, I, I bring that lens to, the, to today's conversation. Um, and, but, you know, largely speaking from the investor perspective, you know, investors are looking to companies and kind of the, the how they treat their employees. And they see that as part of the, long, the recipe for long term value growth. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing investors uh, uh, I was glad to hear that you were already talking about the shareholder proposal process, because um, that's a, 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 an interesting piece of how investors are, are <clears throat> desperate to get good disclosure from companies especially around the human capital uh, piece, whether it, it, you know, moving uh, away, not just board diversity, but employee diversity numbers, um, uh, kind of the welfare of uh, especially frontline workers um, and how that uh, is impacted, um, it, it, especially during the uh, pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the you know, it, it, it's a it, the crucial question that to how do, you know, an important thing to think about from the company's perspective is how do you um, treat your uh, lowest on the ladder employees um, and how do you make sure that they feel integrated? In, is there, you know, a wide uh, gap at disparity in wage, for example, um, or other opportunities? Um, so I think that that, you know, from an investor's perspective, I think looking uh, th 
at that lens through the for the employees is is really a, um, uh, a, a fascinating thing for companies to contemplate. I am uh, very intrigued with uh, l- looking at policies and programs in the company from the perspective of of the employees that are maybe the entry level or the lowest paid, lowest maybe quintile or quartile, and and the gap between that and maybe the most senior paid. Uh, so maybe we'll get into that here as we as we go. So er, look for to all three of you. Uh, thanks for attending today, and thanks for being at the conference. We know your time is, is super precious. So let's get into the let's get into the discussion a little bit. Um, so, h- how does shifting from the model that we had for many many years, of shareholder supremacy, uh, and the thinking around what that meant, and the business decision drivers, to stakeholder balance thinking, change in the way in which how companies should and actually must engage with their employees? And then within that, an example uh, of something specific uh, uh, around how that may have changed over the last uh, few years. And if you don't mind, Mari, I'd like you to kind of kick us off on this um, coming from the uh, family employee, uh, um, a company that, that's a family owned company. Yeah, I, I think um, this is where we had a little bit of a unexpected upper hand, actually, because as a you know, we don't take lightly that there's a huge benefit to being privately owned. Um, you don't have to worry about your decisions on a quarter by quarter basis. So we have always had the benefit of truly being able to think generationally. Um, we know that our when our CEOs are from the family, they will be there for a generation and they are thinking about handing the business over. So I think it put us in a unique position to really think about long term. Um, and I think while that driver came from a, a different place, from the generational place, it's what you will start to see when you include employees very early. Our employees don't plan to leave each quarter. They're not making decisions um, yeah. from that perspective. They are also, you know, it, we can look at the employee data about how quickly they're shifting role to role now as the generations change, but employees for all intents and purposes, I can think, I can, we can assume we're gonna be there for a longer term. and. Um, if they're happy, we'll stay with you. So I think getting the employee feedback for all companies actually shifts everybody to start thinking in a more long-term balanced approach. Um, and so that's that's an incredible benefit because then you start thinking about how employees see problems, see challenges that they're having in the day to day and start wanting to invest or innovate um, and really change the forecast for the future because they're, they're seeing it, you know, they're dealing with particularly the front lines with those inefficiencies on a day by day basis. Um, and if they have a voice in helping us solve for that, you know, it's really sort of limitless potential there. Um, interestingly, our founder, who we uh, refer to as Governor Cox, because he used to be the governor of Ohio before uh, taking, before leaving the company. Um, in his will, he actually asked that um, his family continue to take care of the employees. So one of the tenets of his will of taking over the business was to continue to put employees first. So we've seen these two drivers really play for us in really unique ways. And um, I won't take up too much of your time because I'm sure Paul and Brian have a lot of perspective on this. But I think whether you put it in an empowerment context where the employees just feel safe to bring the ideas forward or whether you actually give them decisions or an ability to participate in innovation competitions. I mean, we've tried this in a number of venues and it it's pretty tried and true, actually, that, that the employee's voice can really lead you to some of the great innovations. Paula Bryan? Uh, well, I'll go next. Um, yeah, so it was really fascinating um, last year First of all, to be at any conference in person. <laughs> you know, it's true. It's true. Uh, so I miss being in person with all of us this year. Um, but I was at the Stanford Directors College and presenting on ESG. And the good news was it was a PAC session. So more than 85 out of the 200 people joined this ESG session. And these are all boards, uh, uh, directors on boards. Um, the good news all ages, uh, all genders all uh, ethnic uh, racial diversity. Um, So that was really powerful to see. And so I think something that continues to be a trend is just the representation on boards continues to be more diverse. Uh, And boards, I think traditionally tilt towards who the investors are 
at least in private mm -hmm. companies mm -hmm. and um, uh, typically. But in public companies, you need a board members who represent stakeholders. So that's why Al Gore has been on the uh, Apple board or Lisa Jackson, former head of the Environmental Protection Agency. And having those custodians of stakeholders on the board is essential. But it's still the case where on the boards today, boards are not 50% women. Um, in fact, no board of an S&P 500 company is more than 60% women. There are no 80% women boards on public companies. And <clears throat> if we want to have a, a poll or a, a chat poll, um, what year do you think the last S&P 500 company added a woman on the board? It was just last year. It was last summer, summer really? of 2019. Wow. Wow. So first of all, we're catching up on that front. And um, on another front, again, linking back to Jeff Rochester's um, presentation this morning, um, the good news is that for companies that report, many, especially in the Dow Jones 30, have 40% um, uh, representation of diversity in the company um, uh, from the employees. But as you go up to manager, that drops to about one third, 33%. And as you go up to the C-suite, it drops to 25%, one in four. So there's still this gap of representation and leadership, um, whether it's uh, Black or Black American, Hispanic, Hispanic American, Asian, Asian American, diversity of passports, diversity of age, mm -hmm. the, typically on the board, uh, if you're under 50, you're unique. And if you're under 50 and not the founder, you're super unique. Um, but um, you know, kids buy products or kids influence their parents to buy products. So uh, there's gaps there. So this um, uh, quantitatively, we can look at all that. And so what's really exciting and boards are starting to be aware of and approve is to have um, disclosure and transparency mm -hmm. like the EEO1 form. So the EEO1 form is by the Equal uh, Employment Opportunity Commission. It's traditionally a confidential document with the federal government and the company. And, but companies can choose to open source it. So Apple has done it, Visa, uh, the credit card company, Travelers, the insurance company. Chevron has a whole interactive website where you can uh, see what's on their EEO1 representation. But the one who's taken it the farthest, and Suzanne Follander uh, mm -hmm. was speaking yesterday mm -hmm. uh, for Intel, uh, is Intel. And Intel has taken it as far as open sourcing their pay ranges by rank and by gender um, and by race and racial ethnic heritage. And so that's what's critical to boards is companies are being um, held accountable. Um, and to do that effectively, you need transparency. And more and more boards are realizing that. And so we're not in the 20th century anymore where hiding information is a competitive advantage. The real competitive advantage in the 21st century is transparent information yeah. among all stakeholders, uh, which the board can embrace. So pause there. Brian. So I just said to, to build on uh, both those excellent comments, um, you know, I think the, 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 there's a mental shift that happens now that companies appear to be embracing the, at least the, the signatories to the, the business roundtable statement of uh, 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 stakeholder capitalism um, that are, you know, moving public companies um, to more of the, the mindset that Maury's company has of their employees where it's not a cost center, but it's this asset that the company has to do. And I think you will start, I mean, we are seeing um, investors holding companies accountable to those statements. Um, and it, especially through the shareholder proposal process of gathering information uh, through disclosure. Um, but you also see that the, the vote tallies for a number of those human capital management um, uh, uh, proposals have been steadily increasing in the last few years. And I think that will be a, a, a continued trend in, in the foreseeable future. Um, and I think that, that kind of investor accountability um, is going to be a, a huge driver to, for boards to say, okay, well, these aren't going to go away. Um, and, you know, there are definite leaders that, you know, that are stepping up and doing the right things. And so investors are, are, are going to go after some laggards and say, it's mm -hmm. time to step up. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, uh, thanks, Brian. You're, you know, it is time to step up. You know, Paul, you said something earlier about if you are not the founder and you're under 50, <clears throat> you're, uh, you're unique uh, in terms of a board. One of the things that that, that we're beginning to do at, at Sustainable Brands is we've created something called a co-mentoring model. Um, one of my younger, very passionate um, uh, 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 employees in the company and I have created a, a bit of rapport and I was doing a lot of mentoring and it dawned on me that he could mentor me as much as I was mentoring him. And so we actually have formalized this idea of, of co-mentoring because there is perspective that somebody of my generation, I'm a boomer, um, just won't see and, and, and they will. And so that kind of restructuring is 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 interesting. Mari, before we uh, end on question number one, I, I want to go back to two quick things for you. First, you've been at Cox, I think, for about two years, correct? Yep. So first, could you characterize quickly the difference you saw when you came in and like, whoa, this is different in rate related to how the employees are uh, relate to the management of the company? And could you comment if you can't? That's OK. But in terms of your tenure, do your does the tenure of your average employee is it is it far beyond the tenure of a of a let's say a publicly traded company? If you know that information, I do. So I don't I don't have the I'd be hesitant to give you the stats because I'm sure I would get them wrong in this sea of um, statisticians. But um, yeah, we anecdotally we joke that you actually haven't been at Cox until you've been there for five years because people stay so long. Um, and my experience has been the same. While it's a great culture for embracing you, um, I continue to feel like the new kid on the block. Um, so I'm waiting for the five year mark to really feel like I've cut my, cut my teeth. Um, but I, I think what's interesting is that, that you hear the same um, catchphrases at every company. I've worked at several Fortune 500s of open door policies and your CEO wants to hear from you and you can feel quite comfortable. And then after they've done their keynote and walked away, everybody, no one would ever presume to actually email your CEO and give them your two cents of them, you know, on, on any. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. So what I was shocked to find is that that's absolutely not the truth at Cox. I mean, the number of emails we get um, that are after four or five exchanges between a frontline employee and someone in our C-suite and they landed on it being a good idea and now tell you, you know, then it gets passed on to say, go figure out how to execute this. It's pretty remarkable. Um, so I think, you know, part of it has to be that you enable enough concrete opportunities for the employees to have a voice that then they start using it organically um, in that way. Because no one's going to naturally feel comfortable. They just know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, so I, I think that's an important part. Part. And um, Scott, I liked your comment about mentoring. We we have some ideas around reverse mentoring that sounds pretty similar. Similar, yes, yeah. very similar. That same concept of like, let's hear from our younger populations, our newer populations, what are the things that we've missed because you've gotten too comfortable with incremental change to not see what the big new shift should be. Yeah, and and, and what comes out of it sometimes is, a, is what's notionally called an unconscious bias. You just simply don't yeah. don't see something, um, Brian. I'm going to ask you to kind of uh, think think about kicking us off on this next question. Uh, in what ways does sort of this newer thinking uh, uh, of, of balancing the, the stakeholder models a bit uh, deal with us relative to the the, the trade offs? Because there's always trade offs and decisions we have to make between uh, values that a, that a company may have and the bottom line that the company is trying to maintain or attain financially speaking. And as a second part to that question, how does this change uh, the idea of sort of short term performance, quarterly earnings type models versus long term value creation? Because, again, this is a this is a, 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 a conference for uh, for change. Uh, equipping people with real tools and I know these are hard trade-offs how do you how do you how would you be help help a CFO or a, somebody in the in the c-suite kind of rethink the blend of this yeah I mean that really is a a, a huge challenge um, in you know kind of I think that there's one you know the approach is you know what does the the firm value uh, as as a firm as a company 
Um, and, you know, how do you, how do you want to be perceived? How do you, you know, you know, what is in your, um, you know, your value proposition to your, uh, your customers? Um, so I, you know, I think, um, I think inherently most people are good people and they want their employees to, to, to succeed. Um, uh, so I think that there is that need to, um, uh, kind of identify what the company itself can do. I mean, I, I think these are kind of global issues that we want to solve. Like we want the employees to, to do well. We want the kind of the, again, look after the lowest tier of employees um, to, you know, that will, and that, you know, collectively will bring society benefits um, that we all want to uh, uh, enjoy. Um, so I think, you know, a company needs to, to kind of contemplate how, you know, what can we control that we can do this and whether it is wages, whether it's benefits, whether it's adding a sustainable investment op option in their 401k. Um, you know, these are kind of uh, small things, um, but these are things that the company can control, um, it, you know, that, and that contributes to a larger public good. Um, but I think that that, the, the, the notion of these are the small steps that we can take um, and manage and measure and mm -hmm. deliver on um, uh, to it, that will contribute to a bigger um, uh, a positive outcome, kind of broadly speaking for society. Paul, uh, Brian touched on that little the three little numbers you like so much. You want to get you want to give it a, a whirl here? <laughs> Uh, well, I like all numbers, little or big. Yeah, 401. <laughs> but uh, 401k, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Brian is uh, probably deep into this and hopefully uh, pleased at the, uh, as many of us are at the election results, um, because the 401k mm -hmm. is one of the great ways, great potential ways to engage dozens, hundreds, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of people in your company by what you offer. And unfortunately, in most large companies, the offerings are very traditional and very index-based. And the risk of investing in an investment index now, Natixis is a financial company, and one of their um, leaders uh, in Europe has said, if you invest in an investment index, you're investing in a world that could be five degrees Celsius hotter um, in the future. Now, five degrees Celsius, for those of us who don't know <laughs> the metric system. You can do your, degrees, do your thing if you want. 10 degrees yeah, Fahrenheit. Cool. Everybody loves and, uh, and I will show, since uh, Scott is so excited about this, I will show this chart here. And um, five degrees is 10 degrees Celsius. And, um, uh, can you guys see my screen? Uh, maybe you can't show slides from, unless you're keynoting. Uh, so let, let me maybe you... see right here. We'll try it right now. <clears throat> yeah, we, oh, there we go. Look right. like you're, look. Can you see this? Um, yeah. So five, well, you're showing, okay. now you're showing your, your, your uh, hopping screen. Oh, God. All right. We'll try it one more time. So five degrees Celsius is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And what that means is if that were, if our, if the earth was our body temperature, um, that would mean that our temperature would be 105 to 110 degrees. And either that means you'd have Ebola or you'd be dead. So we actually can't invest traditionally like we have in the past. So, um, so happy to share this, and this is posted in our in our booth uh, uh, in the um, in the expo. And so, um, the good news is, like, if you're in a smaller, mid-sized company, you can actually um, uh, your the founder or leaders of your private company will listen to you, and so you actually could shift that. Mm -hmm. And um, um, so that's you know we help a dozen different 401ks do that. We also try and help large company 401ks like at Adobe or Genentech. And that's been the beauty of this conference here, the Integrate New Metrics Conference, is that all happened at New Metrics. People heard about changing their 401k and uh, Katie Escoffier uh, at Genentech went off and did it mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. to help uh, illuminate and educate. So it's up to us, we, we can make our own. But Brian, what are you seeing? Are you seeing 401k shift? 
Um, you know, it's uh, it has. Uh, you know, we're coming out with our trends report on t on Monday, um, and there will be some new numbers uh, around retirement um, uh, in the in ESG. Um, but it's the slowest growing piece of ESG. I mean, ESG has been steadily growing um, in the last decade, um, but the retirement piece has been the the laggard. Um, so there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, the problem has been this regulatory risk that is ping-ponging and pendulum between uh, different parties uh, in power. Um, and for those who don't follow the ins and outs of the Department of Labor, they just finalized a rule that makes it much more difficult to include ESG mm -hmm. in retirement plans. Um, USF was fought it along the way, um, and we're working with people on Capitol Hill. We're talking to the new administration with some policy proposals to make sure that this pathway is cleared and hopefully have a, a, a permanent fix so that plan administrators who are notoriously you know, risk averse um, can feel comfortable making these uh, uh, selections for their plan participants. Um, and I think, you know, just like you were talking about uh, boards, uh, company boards, um, you know, companies should look at their uh, uh, retirement plan boards and make sure that they're representing, you know, uh, the the partic plan participants. So, you know, typically, you know, you have a very white and very male um, uh, uh, 401k, you know, decision making board within a company. Um, you know, you you will, you know, if you have more plan participants represented or a channel for them to be uh, heard, it will make it a lot make a lot more sense to include sustainable investment options. Um, within uh, these offerings, uh, because that's there's demand. Um, younger employees are demanding this, and um, hopefully that Brian, will continue. Not to, right, bring it home. Well, I was going to actually step on your toes, Scott, and ask Brian a follow up question. Um, but I, I think you were starting to hit on it at the end. But I was curious if you saw in that research which stakeholder group was push, pushing the most for the change in 401k. If it was coming from the employees, if it was generational, if it was coming from, I mean, so many different to choose from, but if you had any data on who was driving the request? Yeah. Um, so we, I, I think our, the data that we used for the report is, is, is little, uh, just kind of uh, broad numbers. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I think the answer to your question, I've seen studies along the way, but definitely younger uh, uh, employees are doing it. But there's also a performance piece that is driving this because ESG funds are, you know, the myth of underperformance is, is evaporating. Um, and in fact, you know, in the last six quarters, the ESG funds have been outperforming their indexes. So I think that you will, you know, it, it's irresponsible not to consider these. Yeah, Maury, uh, the people leading it are um, young or older. Uh, primarily women, uh, but also men. And um, they just see it and speak up. So whether it's Serena Zhao at uh, Adobe, um, who happens to be a graduate of Presidio Graduate School, just like Katie Escoffier has a sustainability MBA and is doing mm -hmm. that at Genentech and Roche. Um, Kristen Magnuson at Stoke, which is a green architecture, sustainable architecture company in San Francisco. She went to Bioneers conference and she came back and said, our work is about creating sustainable agriculture. Why isn't our 401k doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. And so when those people take it to the powers that be, what generally happens in smaller or mid-sized companies where most of the executives know every employee's name, when you have 100 or 200 or 500 people, you still know everybody's name. And so it, it can change pretty quickly. It can change in less than a year. It can even change in half a year. At larger companies, um, uh, it just it's a the four hundred one k is run as a low cost center, not as an employee engagement opportunity. And um, and Joy Poland, who's involved in sustainable brands, one of the things that she worked on with a company called Four Star in Massachusetts, uh, which presented here a couple of years ago, is they brought the four hundred one k. The founder brought the the four hundred one k to be more sustainable. The company, the employees started saying, oh, aren't our customers and suppliers in our 401k? Yes, they are. Oh, shouldn't we tell them that we have a sustainable 401k that has those companies in it? 
And then Joy Take It, the next step was they went and got a grant from Commonwealth of Massachusetts to do a sustainable supplier program. Um, and uh, um, and so that that all turned into not just one more choice in a 401k, it changed the culture of the company, it transformed the culture of the company. So that's the power of it. It's an employee engagement tool, not just a low cost investing center. Yeah. And I, I've heard, uh, you know, anecdotal of, uh, evidence of um, that, you know, either financial firms or high tech firms who are using sustainable uh, options in their 401k as a recruitment tool. For younger uh, work as a differentiator uh, to draw to really attract. Um, Mari, any other insights on this one? Yeah, yeah. So, what I find is interesting, I worked many years ago at another company at switching to 401k and having this option. So, I was curious about since then what, what trends you're seeing and how it's driving. And so, I think it's nice, so, so critical to hear that. The, the myth that you're taking a risk or that you're having to pay something for your values has gone away. And now it's not only, you know, sort of a, a moral imperative, but also smart financial sense. So it's, it's just sort of interesting to, to hear that we're still having to bust that myth in some corners. Um, but I think what it speaks to more that I, I'm really interested in as well for this panel is that, um, it's not only a huge lever to pull just in how we want to change the how other businesses are are managing themselves and the value of our dollar but it speaks very much to employees wanting to have ownership and power and and i think it's hard when there's so many companies that have a vision statement or, or have similar um values statements for employees to know how to actually tactically engage. And so one of the things that sort of sparks for me is that this is a way employees really feel like they can participate in a change and a solution. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot we could extrapolate from that desire for them to engage to other parts of, of the business, because um, I think we're hearing from employees time and time again that they don't want um, to just hear the nice window dressing. They want to know how to participate in that change um, in, the, in their you know nine to five. Um, yeah, and there's this website called cleanportfolios.com um, that shows how other companies have um, gone down that path. Um, and even companies like Google um, only have one sustainable fund <laughs> in their portfolio, um, and employees don't even realize what, what's in there. So it's a great chance to engage. Um, we'll shift here um, to, to the next question. Uh, you know, um, recently in my prepping for this conference, I've been talking to a lot of people and uh, my memories failed me on who actually said this to me, but I thought it was excellent. So one of the one of the things that could be happening here is historically in the old model, we had a job and you fit an employee into a job. And now the model might be you have a human being who has talents and gifts and you frame the job around what those talents and gifts are. And that's a that's an interesting an interesting different way of looking at how you fill out a team. Um, moving to the next uh, uh, next question, and we've actually touched on this already once, but maybe Paul, you can kick us off on this one. Specifically, again, in this topic of balanced stakeholder models and, and with the emphasis on the employee here, um, how should companies look programmatically at their lowest entry level folks? let's say the bottom quintile, and how should, and with, in parallel with that, it's not necessarily the same thing, but how should a company look at diversity, equity, inclusion programmatically in terms of hiring and, and promoting? Sure. When you say the lowest level folks, you just mean Paid. the least diverse at the company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean yeah, yeah, it's quality okay. uh, or, or anything yeah. else. It could be the high yeah. IQ people. I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I like calling them the front line because oh, usually line, that's, that's, better. Better. that's a great, that's a way better way to say it. I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. That's where we put them. And in yeah, a true employee organization, they're not, you know, it's not low or high. It's how do we all No, I together. appreciate that a lot. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, I think one of the key gaps that we found, especially this year in 2020, with all the traumas that we've had, especially in racial injustice, is uh, mentoring. And what's, what is missing is how to mentor, uh, especially diverse staff, 
into opportunities to continue at the company. And if, and that a lot of that happens informally, like there's informal adoptions of, of new employees who, um, uh, you know, there's, um, everything from do you play softball, basketball, or squash after work uh, when we would all get together. So mm -hmm. I'd say that's one of the key opportunities um, and uh, to really formally facilitate those relationships and encourage um, and welcome those diverse views. One of the things I experienced early in my career was a 360 review mm -hmm. and um, and a 360 review means you, people not only review you, your manager reviews you, but you review your manager. And um, uh, have, oh, being open to that honest, constructive feedback is, is really critical. And Scott, you mentioned like jobs built around people instead of people filling a holes in jobs. So that's something, one of the groups pursuing that um, is not only is uh, peach farmers in uh, the Central Valley in California. So Nikiko Masamoto um, and uh, her dad Mas Masamoto, they used to hire the strongest um, uh, young Hispanic men to pick as many peaches as possible. And there was a lot of uh, the quality varied because they did it so fast and they competed to do it fast. And they've ended up working with women, older women even, who are taking care of kids and their families, but they then have restructured the work stream around um, the work supporting their schedule and their skills, and they turn over less. They stay longer because they found this work-life balance. So that's probably another characteristic with new incoming frontline workers is not only opportunity, but work-life balance. So, but uh, Maury may have more to add there dealing with hundreds or thousands of employees at Cox, right? Yeah, I mean, I think first I'd be remiss if I didn't say we need to make sure we're paying a living wage. Um, so first and foremost, I think before we jump, you know, you've got to get the, the baseline components right. And um, it, we are, you know, sort of the royal we, the United States is not comprehensively paying a, a living wage to our frontline workers. So I think we're going to start thinking about the prosperity of our communities, if we're going to think about the um, ability for our employees to go the extra mile to do the necessary job training and skills training and continue in their career development, we've got to get some of the headache that comes with not making a living wage off of their, their plates. So I, I think that's a big component that if we don't get that part right, we are missing. Um, we're going to fall really short. But I think the other thing, um, I like what you said about Paul, Paul about mentorship. Um, we're starting to really explore, as everybody is, you know, what did we miss and how do we need to do better um, with our employees this this year? You know, it's shined a, a magnifying glass on on everybody. Um, but taking mentorship a different step and taking it to sponsorship um, and moving it even further because it, you're so right that we all need those mentors that that guide us and coach us and provide us with that real feedback, but who's also already in the room you aspire to be in that will raise your name, that will recommend you for something that sees the opportunities that you don't even know you're missing out on. And how do we set up sponsors, executive sponsors for our talent that, that helps bring them through the ranks. So that's um, a twist that we're really working our way through and I think has a lot of legs um, to really help with the IND you know, evening out the IND space, because if you don't have somebody in the room speaking up for you, um, there's only so much that coaching is going to get you because you're just not, you know, you're not, just not provided those opportunities. I think one of the other pieces, Scott, to your question that um, we're really trying to think about is how do you make sure that your frontline talent is getting the skills-based training that they need to move on? Um, for example, in our automotive division, we do a lot of um, recommissioning of, of cars of, of used vehicles and we have a couple um, contracts with Amazon and with Lyft for you know their vehicles and what we've learned is that our mechanics which you can imagine we hire a lot of to do that work now are really dealing with a computer um, so what before um, was the engine of the car now the backup camera there's a backup camera and so what computer system within it need and what coding skills do they need. Um, so that idea of 
STEAM training that we thought of so much for our community and nonprofit partners, we really needed to start thinking internally about how we upskill our own employees so that they are ready for the evolution of their job and for the next job. And um, I won't claim we've cracked the code, but it is something we're really starting to think about so that we can maintain that talent. We're not losing them in those middle ranks um, the way I think so many companies are, are starting to see a, a drop off. Mm -hmm. You know, you know. I think that the last year it put a you know opened a lot of eyes on a number of fronts. So you know, I don't know how many meat processors there are at this conference, but um, you know, when I think of frontline workers, you know, I think of these meat processing uh, employees who, you know, were thrust into those jobs in the pandemic, working shoulder to shoulder, maybe not having the right PPE. Um, you know, that is a recipe for a disaster, uh, you know, for the health of, of the employees, for the reputation of the company. Um, uh, so I think, you know, companies have to, um, you know, take into the to account the welfare um, of, of the, the, the frontline employees. Um, and then I think on the diversity aspect that, that we've learned through, you know, this year's you know, kind of awakening of to injustice, uh, racial injustice, is that um, you know uh, company leaders, you know, all the way up from kind of supervisors on up, you know, need to understand their biases, um, and you know whether that's they need training or you know some other mechanism within the company um, to understand those biases that will uh, kind of unlock the potential within their workforce um, that that may have you know kind of you know been below the surface, you know, subconscious. That um, has uh, not allowed, you know, diversity policies to uh, to flourish. Well, I want to uh, Brian piggyback off of that thought. Uh, you know, we we had a little a little agenda here, uh, but but that that last point is, is interesting. I'd like to shift the gear a little bit to employee engagement. You know, Gallup uh, did a poll here a few years back that said, uh, you know, I don't remember the stats, but uh, there was a huge percentage that were, were disengaged and, and even a relatively large percentage that was actively disengaged, which means that it wasn't that they just didn't like enjoy their jobs much, but that they, they actually actively sort of pushed back uh, at, at, at the system. Uh, and if we think about, again, rebalancing this equation a little bit where we go to more longer term value, what have you seen, all three of you, relative to increasing active employee engagement? Because I, I am a core believer that if you get that, man, all kinds of issues go away. But if you don't, you, you, you're, you're problematic every day. I'd love to unpack that question a little bit. Well, I love the statistic about employee engagement. Um, Gallup regularly takes a poll. They've pulled several million corporate employees. So I'm pretty sure it's mostly large enterprises. And the average employee engagement that they poll, which is, are you engaged at work? Um, uh, you know, satisfied, find connections is 20%. Yeah, that's So really that horrible. means one out of five people yeah. is engaged at work. I like to twist it a little bit and think about it this way. If you're at work five days a week, then it could be like all employees are only engaged one day a week. Mm -hmm. So if you could just get that engagement up to two days a week, mm -hmm. you might be able to double your productivity. Mm -hmm. um, but those are just, you know, uh, listening to employees versus telling employees mm -hmm. is key. Um, when they ask for sustainable 401k, listening to them when they need personal protective equipment on the front line, supporting them. It's interesting in that um, when COVID hit earlier this year, the first reactors were corporations. Corporations did take care of their people and did not send them to conferences and pulled them back. And so that happened before even San Francisco Mayor London Breed, mm -hmm. you know, called for a shutdown or uh the national shutdown that never came only came by state so that corporations do care about their employees but facilitating that and curating that out is really essential and getting this 20 percent higher like into it for example as 95 percent of employees return their uh annual employee survey this month november you know before thanksgiving and the people held accountable 
are their supervisors and managers. So if you are a supervisor or manager of low employee engagement, HR is showing up at your door and asking what's going on. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Brian, Mari. Um, yeah, I, 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 I don't, um, as far as employee engagement, I, I mean, I, I think it, it seems obvious in any organization that you, you're with is that, you know, if you feel valued by uh, the people you work for or report to, or you feel like you're contributing to um, uh, the, the goals of the, the, the entity, that, that, that it's a, you, know, you, you do better work, you, you know, you're going to deliver more. Um, and I think that creating those environments where the employee feels valued is, is, is paramount. Um, and it's, it's listening, it's mentoring, it's opportunity, it's training. I mean, there's a, I think all of these pieces that we've been talking about through the, um, through the conversation, um, uh, you know, are, you know, build into that, that, that desire and that notion of, of, you know, I'm, I'm important. I, you value me, you know, you want me to be here and I'm going to. Yeah. Gonna I think there's, um, one of the things we've been talking about a lot as well, particularly in the diversity space this year is that it's, you know, diversity is the data and inclusion is the way the employees actually feel. Do they feel comfortable? Or do they feel a part of the culture? Does, can they actually bring them themselves to work? Um, and, you know, diversity is sort of, you know, what box that you check as we think about, you know, and diversity is an important proof point. It's an important, you know, the, as I think we've been talking this whole, this whole session, the data is what holds us all accountable, but that feeling component is really where the rubber meets the road. And it's so much more difficult both to make happen, but also, you know, to quantify. Um, I think, so when we think about that, we've been, you know, thinking a lot about how do we make sure we foster that and how do you do the pulse surveys and how do you empower, but I think one of the key learnings we've had over the last couple of years as well is that that's related to ESG is that the metrics for transparency and, and the progress that you're making, of course, are, are critical for all the reasons we've talked about, whether it's stakeholders and investors or um, transparency improving that you're doing what you've said you've done. But the goals that then come out of that have been critically important for our employee engagement. So where do we aspire to be five years, 10 years down the road and why has been critical for them, our employees to feel like they actually get a place to play, that they know what goals we're trying to achieve in the environmental and community space, and then they can have a hand in participating in that change. Um, and I think that has really sealed the deal for our employees between sort of this idea of knowing the data, but then how are they included and how do they have ownership and empowerment to participate? Um, and we've seen a lot of really innovative shifts from that where, um, you know, one of my favorite phrases from an employee listening session when we were talking about goals and aspirations and purpose of our company was that they wanted to move beyond programs that were band-aids to solutions. Um, and so I think when you have goals, it really inspires people to think about scale and big picture and what their eight hours of volunteering or their eight hours of in a, you know innovation or whatever it is and how it plays a part in that. Because um, it, you know I think that the surveys are important, but the, the surveys only get us so far knowing that there's a problem, but not solving for that emotional component. Well, we appreciate that. We are, um getting close to the end. So what I'd uh, ask each of you to do is just give us a, maybe a summary takeaway uh, re related to this topic that uh, somebody could take back to work with. I hadn't thought, of, thought about that. <clears throat> well, one of my favorite things is obviously metrics. That's what we do at Hip Investor is metrics and portfolios. Um, but every board, we, we kick this off by like, what's the blend of stakeholder value and shareholder value? So every frontline employee, manager, supervisor, executive board member should know what the top five metrics are for the business. And um, so they could be what we're calling the five crises of today. How are we solving the five crises in health like COVID or wealth? Uh, like income inequality, earth, climate action, 
uh, uh, equality of gender and race or even trust? How we, are we honest and transparent and not corrupt? So health, wealth, earth equality, trust. But for businesses, it's typically things like financial. We need to have that one. An employee metric for sure. Um, and then you get three more. So what are they going to be? Are they going to be greenhouse gas reduction? Is it going to be inclusion, diversity, and equality? Is it going to be how often we get sued? Is it going to be the level of CEO pay to average worker pay? Will we have a fair wage? And is the CEO fairly compensated for true performance? Um, so that's what I'd say. What are your five metrics? And in the best case, you can pick fewer, but um, at most, you know, most people remember three. But boards, you know, boards are responsible for so much. What are our five top metrics? How do they include stakeholders as well as shareholders? That'd be my to-do nice. list for everybody. I, I, it's really nice. Appreciate that. I, I think I would add to that. So the metrics I agree are, are critically important, and I think um, we've got a lot of folks at your conference who get to influence those metrics. There are also a lot of folks who. who don't have that seat at the table to influence that piece. So I would add, what's the tactical thing that you as an individual can do? Because I think there's a lot of value into believing in the ripple effect of the, the small changes that we can make individually um, and how those ladder up to a much bigger play. So I would look at those metrics and then pick what's the, what's the thing I can do for one person, for one group to push forward the 401k plan or, or, you know, programmatically, what can I get my arms around? Um, because I think also it can be a bit overwhelming um, to think about how to, how to deal with um, these big world challenges, but we all, we all can take one tactic tomorrow. Um, and so I think narrowing in on the, the piece we can play to start seeing that change is really critical. And I'll add that the, you know, you know, identify ways to bring employees into the company's goals for these broader ideas, whether it's climate, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, social metrics or diversity, you know, bring, bring your employees in to allow them to participate in that process. Um, I, I think, you know, gives them a, a kind of a hands-on tactical feel to, I am, you know, contributing to something bigger. Um, as you know, in, in, in building buy-in with the company and kind of that employee motivation, you know, and I think there really are simple steps. Like if you're an employer, you know, adding a, a, a sustainable option to your 401k, if you're an employee, go talk to your plan administrator or, you know, CFO, whoever is running your 401k today and say, mm -hmm. I, I, I want this, I need this. Um, and those are really some simple steps. And, you know, for, for leader, company leaders, I would even say, you know, this is a little outside of the, the boundaries of, of this this session, but, I, you know, if you are doing good practices, you should be telling policymakers, uh, you should send them your, your press releases when you're doing something good. They don't understand what, you know, good businesses uh, and good leaders are doing. They don't hear enough of it. Um, and that, in you know, in the world I operate in is a huge challenge to know that there's, you know, the private, some parts of the private sector really are doing good things and doing the right way uh, and should demonstrating leadership. Um, so I, I would encourage folks to just, you know, you know, in addition to your press release, your press list, mm -hmm. add, you know, local policymakers, you know, state representatives, you know, federal uh, representatives uh, to that list so they can see what, uh, what uh, good uh, operating we're up against our time uh, thank you so much for your insights I greatly appreciated for the work that you do and for adding so much value to the attendees of the conference everybody have a really fantastic day thanks everyone thank you